What's up everybody? This is Aaron from AaronsAudioCorner.com and today I'm going to do a budget 10 inch powered subwoofer shootout. All the subwoofers behind me are up for test. They were all purchased from Amazon and by budget I mean under $200. You can see behind me I've got Sony, Klipsch, Polk Audio, Yamaha, and Elec all represented in this test. We're going to see which one provides us the best boom for the buck. Yeah, dad joke. Let's do this. As the dedicated audio guy in my friend circle, at work, relatives, you name it, I'm always asked, hey, I'm about to do X, what should I buy? For example, a few months back, a buddy of mine was building a home, and he said that he was on a budget, but within the budget, he wanted to build a pretty awesome home theater system. One of his requirements was he had about 150 bucks, I think, to spend on a subwoofer, so I did what most people do, I went to Crutchfield, I went to Amazon, I went to Parts Express, I went to Accessories for Less, and I just shopped around and looked, $150, what can you get? And then I looked up a little bit more to see if there's enough of a difference in $150 to $200 to um, warrant him purchasing something a little bit more expensive outside of his already nominal budget. And with that in mind, what I found was there's a whole lot of similarities in that range. You're typically talking in that range, I mean, $100 to $200. You're typically talking 10 inch power subwoofers only. There's not really many 12s and the eights are all below $100. But the problem was that you don't really know what you're getting unless you find somebody who's conducted some testing on some of those more uh, cheaper and expensive subwoofers. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of that information out there. So with that in mind, I recently decided to start doing my own subwoofer testing. And this video is the first round of that. The reason I'm doing a budget version is because what I just said, when I went shopping for budget subwoofers, there's a lot out there, but you don't really know what you're getting. And I'm hoping that through this video and future ones that I'll be able to help you guys understand and get a better feel for what you can get and what you should be getting within a certain price range. And in this particular version, I'm shopping only within Amazon's um, products because Frankly, when most people shop, I've found, they go straight to Amazon, they try to find what they can buy within their budget, they click buy, they get it within a couple of days and they're happy. I try to mimic that, that shopping style, that shopping mindset with, um, with my own actions. <clears throat> Excuse me, Peter Brady. With my own actions and because of that, now I've got these five subwoofers we have behind me and I'm gonna walk you guys through each of those, the features of them, and then we'll go through the data that I've captured and if you're curious about how I've obtained the data that I'm going to show you, there's another video that I've made recently, which I'll put in the comment section or in the description below. So make sure you watch that if you're curious. But with that said, let's go ahead and start looking at the subwoofers. So to kick things off, this is the Sony SACS9 subwoofer. It is a 10 inch subwoofer like all of the others, and it has a little mesh grill on the front of it and I'm going to pop off so you can see the actual drive unit itself and there it is not a lot of fancy stuff going on here just a plain I don't even know if this is painted I guess maybe veneered um, subwoofer enclosure it's just a flat black nothing special here frankly it's not a it's not a great looking sub it's actually an ugly sub in my opinion but when people are buying subwoofers they're not typically buying on looks they're looking for performance and output so We'll get to that in a second. Now we'll spin this around. On the back, what we can see is a gain knob, min to max, a crossover frequency range available from 50 hertz minimum to 200 hertz max, a phase switch for normal or reverse, 0, 180, same thing, and a power save button, auto and off. And then the line input, which is just basically an RCA input. You can use standard RCA, coax, LFE input, whatever and then it has the actual speaker uh, line input and output as well in case you had that kind of connection the speaker itself does include a port on the back and it's all plastic on the back side to hide the amplifier which you can see some of the internals inside of there and the power button here next up is the klipsch r10 sw with a current retail value on amazon prime for 199 shipped so let's look at this. Again, basic subwoofer, 
common theme with all of these guys that are in this budget price range that I'm talking about here. The grill, you can pop it off so you get that very unmistakable Klipsch goldish orange color cone. 10 inch subwoofer, if you tap on it, it makes sounds. It's got a little light here to indicate when it's powered on. We'll get to that in a second. And yeah, just a, I guess another maybe veneer or some kind of, I'm not, frankly, I'm not sure of the finishing, but it, it does have like a nice sheen to it. Um, has a texture to it as well if you're into aesthetics. And then we're gonna flip around to the back side and gain settings here, low pass filter here. So you can go from, what is this, 40 Hertz uh, to where it says LFE and LFE just means pass through. Auto on and off. So you have three choices, off, auto, and on. And when it's set to auto, that means if you provide a signal, then it will flip on on its own. So if you've got your AVR connected to it, your AVR will trigger it to come on so you don't have to physically get up, walk over to it, and flip it on. Phase, zero to 180, normal, reverse, same thing, nothing fancy there. And RCA input with the LFE channel designated for the left if you wanted to just to provide it a single RCA. Next up is the Yamaha NSSW100 in black. Uh, one thing I will say about this subwoofer is it has a grill. If this grill comes off, I'm not sure how to get it off without doing a little bit more effort than I was willing to put into it. I didn't want to potentially damage the outer structure or anything trying to figure out how to get the subwoofer grill off. It may come off really easily and just be a way that I wasn't willing to chance it, but now you know. Flipping it around to the side, you see big old port area, nice non-turbulent looking port. Uh, that's a design feature they say is supposed to reduce, I'm assuming, the output of a typical port noise that you would have. I can't say that it helped in that regard in my testing, so we're going to keep going. We get to the back, and it's a very, very simple amplifier setup. You got a power on and off, you've got a single input, and you've got a gain knob. You don't have crossovers, and you don't have polarity. Now, you would think typically when you're not including something that you're making it up in other places. In the case of this subwoofer, which currently retails at about 179, I believe. I'm not seeing anywhere where that performance is being made up. Another claim about this subwoofer is that it has servo technology. Typically servo technology is used to decrease nonlinearity, which would essentially just mean reduced distortion. However, based on my tests, which are all fundamentally based on distortion levels, I can say that the servo technology doesn't seem to help this subwoofer perform better than any of the other ones in its price class. It might help it perform better than it would perform without the servo technology, but I can say that as far as my data goes and, and what I'm seeing, the servo technology isn't making it perform better than any of the other ones that I've tested behind me, in that regard at least. Next on the shopping block is the ELAC Sub 1010, current retail price of $129.99 via Amazon Prime. Basic sub again. The one thing I will note about this subwoofer is that it's quite compact and you probably can tell from just looking at it here on my stand that it has a much smaller overall profile and obviously that's a big benefit to people who don't have a lot of space to work with to begin with. The aesthetics of this subwoofer to me are pretty high. Again, it's a very basic looking speaker. There's, nothing, there's no flash to it. There's, there's really nothing that stands out about it except to me this subwoofer looks like a good subwoofer. You can't judge all subwoofers by their face. You shouldn't. And I've definitely learned that in the past. But when I'm looking at the speaker, I just feel like there's some quality there. And in my test, it actually shows up that this is one of the better performers and it's actually one of the cheapest ones. So, interesting. Now spin it around. And on the back, you've got the plastic port, a little bit of a cardboard in there. I can see the subwoofer back in there. Gain knob, speaker level inputs, Crossover from 40 to 150 hertz, phase 0, 180 flip. And then you've got the power on off switch and auto, which like the Klipsch will allow you to provide uh, auto turn on when the AVR sends a signal to it. It'll, it'll turn on and it'll know it's ready to be played. And then the RCA inputs for the line inputs. Last but not least, I have the Polk PSW-10. 
Current retail price is $129 on Amazon Prime. Now this subwoofer for the same price as the ELEC is quite a bit bigger. And if you look at the front of the face, let me do this, Let's do a comparison here. Here's the ELEC. So the ELEC you can see is quite a bit smaller. All right, coming back. So we'll pop the grill off. And you can see that it has a front port, unlike any of the other speakers that I've tested. This is the only one with a front port. The Yamaha had the side port, the rest all had rear ports. So that's something to keep in mind if you're worried about placement. If you have to put a subwoofer right next to a wall, you don't want the port facing that wall. You want the port away from that wall. Otherwise, you will choke off the flow of that port and decrease the output and potentially cause some other unwanted resonances that you might, well, you probably will hear. So that is one good feature about the subwoofer, especially if you're concerned with placement. Size, again, bigger than the ELAC. Uh, it's one of the bigger ones. It might actually be a little bit bigger than the Klipsch. I can't recall, but it's certainly one of the larger subwoofers that I've, that I've tested in this particular round. We're going to spin it around. we got a gain knob here, typical low pass. Now this low pass, it starts at 80 and goes up to 160. Most of the other ones are 40 or 50. Um, not a big deal, but just something to note. Auto on and off, again, like the Klipsch and, and like the ELAC. Line input left and right. I'm assuming that's probably an LFE channel. And then we've got the speaker level inputs there too. So not a lot of flash here with this subwoofer. I mean, you're paying 130 bucks. You don't expect a lot of flash. But surprisingly, this subwoofer and the ELAC are the better performers of the group. And speaking of that, let's now look at the data. All right, so here we are at my website which is aaronsaudiocorner.com, CEA 2010 subwoofer testing. And this page basically lays out all of the test setup, uh, how the measurements were acquired and all that. If you want to watch a video discussing more of that in detail and giving you a demonstration of the test itself, you can do so via this uh, YouTube video right here. The section CEA 2010A and CEA 2010B define how the two different measurement methods are conducted. And the former, the A method, is one that many websites currently provide, such as Audioholics, Database, uh, Brent Butterworth from Wirecutter.com. And the latter, the B portion, is one that I think only I am providing, at least from a third-party standpoint. The two different test methods both work to define the maximum capability for a subwoofer, the maximum output for a subwoofer, but the distortion thresholds used to define those maximum SPL capabilities are quite different. The CEA 2010A has the same distortion thresholds for each of the frequencies that it's tested against, whereas B changes the thresholds of distortion depending on frequency. I actually prefer the latter in the way that it alters the distortion thresholds and it makes them more stringent higher in frequency. But a lot of people prefer A because it is also more stringent on the lower frequencies. So in order to provide a best of both worlds, I'm providing both results. And when you go to my website, you will see both results. So let's go to my spreadsheet, which is where I document all of my findings. And then this first page is the forward, and it defines everything that I've just told you. And I'll also explain here how I do use Amazon affiliate links. That's something that everybody who uses Amazon affiliate links is supposed to disclose. Uh, so hold your YouTube reviewers and your fellow reviewers responsible or accountable, I should say, for not disclosing when they do not. Um, if you want to buy anything that I talk about here, if you want to do that through my Amazon affiliate link or my Parts Express links, etc., feel free to do so. That would help me out with a small commission. It doesn't cost you anything extra. So put that out there. Now we get onto the results table for CEA 2010A, which is the same threshold for distortions throughout all frequencies. I'm not gonna explain a whole lot here. Everything as far as understanding the, the test thresholds and, and all of that can be found on my page. Uh, I'm just gonna skip straight to the results. So the results column that you probably kinda care about the most is the CEA 2010A average. I've taken the liberty of averaging 40 to 80 hertz um, frequency maximums in terms of SPL. And in this column, the highest output is the Polk PSW10, and the second highest output is the ELAC. And it just so happens that both of those subwoofers cost the least out of the five that I've tested in this video. So in terms of value, the ELAC and the Polk are the better values. 
If you want to dig a little bit further into the data, you're more than welcome to do so. Everything is provided in this table. And then we're going to skip to the B portion of testing where it is very distortion thresholds per frequency. And what you can see here is that the clips actually failed at 20 Hertz, whereas none of the other ones did. The highest output in this test is the ELAC with 107 dB, and the Polk is the second highest with just shy of that at 106 dB, and the others are below that. And again, the Polk and the ELAC being the cheapest ones to me represent the better value. Now, if you go to this max SPL graphic, this just is another way of presenting to you the data in graphical format. And the thing that stands out to me here is again, the Polk is the highest SPL output across the board in the CEA 2010A method. And then if we go to the B, you can see that Polk stands out a little bit higher in the, what is this, the 40 to 63 Hertz region. And the ELAC wins out above 63 Hertz and, and it's actually more linear in response, meaning it's a, a more flat response. Now, if you go to the actual frequency response, which is raw measurement, how the subwoofers measure, not in terms of maximum SPL capability per frequency, but just in general. ELAC is the most linear, um, and that is the orange highlighted here. Now, the Sony has a bit of a knee at around 63 in the 60 hertz region. The Klipsch also has a bit of a knee in that region. So that gives them a more, a more punchy sound in that area but then they start to fall off below that. However, the Klipsch, if you go and look at the B maximum testing, the Klipsch actually has more output capability with the same distortion thresholds as the other ones in the lower octaves from 25 hertz to 31.5 hertz. It has about five dB more output. So if you're hunting for a subwoofer just to cover below 40 hertz, then the Klipsch is probably gonna be the one you want but it also failed the 20 hertz threshold in the CEA 2010B testing and in the CEA 2010A testing, which we'll go back and look at here on this graphic, you can see that it stops at 40 hertz. That means it failed every other frequency check before that. So between the two different tests, again, the ELAC and the Polk seem to win out, but depending on exactly what you're looking for, depending on the thresholds that you care about, that may change. And I'm gonna leave it there. I don't wanna bury this thing too much more in complication, but my final recommendation, if you're on a budget, is simply to go with either the Polk or the ELAC. And what I would also recommend is, instead of spending four or $500 for a single subwoofer, I would take that money and I would consider actually buying two or three of one of these subwoofers, placing them throughout your room in different areas. That will not only provide you additional output, but it will smooth the frequency response down low in, in the lower portion of the spectrum. The reason that's important is because typically if you use just one subwoofer, you're going to get a whole bunch of holes in your response, peaks in your response, you're going to get all sorts of resonances and dropouts, things like that. When you use a multiple subwoofer array, as it's called, what you get is smoothing between those points. So each subwoofer kind of helps fill in the other one. If you want to read more about that, you can look at Getty's research and you can look at Harmon's research. And I'll try to remember to put that in the description as well, I'll provide you some links there. But again, my final recommendation, ELAC or Polk for the value, and if you can afford it to get two or three of them, that would really take things a step above and beyond where you would currently be at without using multiple subwoofers. So that's it for me. If you like this, give me a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe, do all that cool stuff. If your friends bother you and say, hey, what subwoofer should I get? I've only got 150 bucks. Now you know, provide them my link. Then you don't have to tell them anything. If they watch it, great. If they don't, whatever. But it doesn't take any more of your time to simply provide them the link and let them figure it out on their own, right? And we can help educate the community as a whole. So that's it. And I'm out. You guys take care. Peace.